elections of 23rd February for the Presidential and National Assembly and those of the 9th of March for the Governorship and State Houses of Assembly. Now it is widely held that the pattern of voting during the recent elections speaks volumes. Well, a great number of the electorate is believed to have voted for individuals and not parties. Well, there are interesting issues which the 2019 elections have thrown up, such as protest voting, what's referred to as protest voting in some states, a development many say will help the political environment in checkmating excesses and poor governance. There are, however, those with divergent views that politicians and their supporters are yet to imbibe the appropriate democratic culture. That's with respect to the elections, which they see as dominated by an attitude of do-or-die politics. Now, how well do politicians recognize that leadership is about service and that decency and respect for political opponents is not a sign of weakness? How well have voters influenced political decisions? And what's the way out of electoral violence, vote buying, and other ills? What lessons from the just concluded elections? Now, these are some of the issues we'll be considering tonight on NTA Tuesday Live. I'd like to introduce to you our guests at this point in time. I'd like to welcome Dr. Leonard Nzemwa is a political communication and human development management expert and a public affairs commentator. Thanks for being with us here today. Thank you very much, Cyril. Let me also welcome to this program Audu Gambo, a professor of political science, University of Joss. Thanks for being here, Prof. My pleasure. To All be right. Here. And we're also joined tonight by Rutimi Lawrence Uyikomi. He's the chief press secretary to the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. Rutimi, thanks for being here. Thank you for having right. me. And uh, joining us uh, from uh, Kaduna Network Center is a senior advocate of Nigeria, Yunus Ustaz Usman. He joins us from uh, Kaduna Network Center. Uh, glad to have you join us here. All right. And uh, we also joining us, also joining us from uh, uh, my Duguri Network Center is uh, Senator Kaka Malam Yali. He is chairman of the National Teachers Institute and also chairman of Borno State Civil Service Commission. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, as we said, many issues have been thrown up by the just concluded elections. So many, many, many issues, and uh, we'll begin to examine them in some greater detail with our guests. But first, let's acquaint you with a procedure, as we usually do on every Tuesday on this program. At the appropriate time, you can get to join the discussion in the studio. The platforms will be on your screen. We advise that you take advantage of them. However, for those who will be phoning in, as we always say, when your call gets through to the studio, do us a favor, turn down the volume of your TV set. Just reduce the volume. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know that your call has been passed through to the studio, your name will appear on screen. Once that happens, it means you are through direct to the studio. And you're encouraged to just go straight on, make your comment, ask your question, and uh, try and keep it as brief as possible so that others can also get on the platform. So, once again, welcome to NTA Tuesday Live. Tonight, it's all about the gains and lessons of the just concluded 2019 general elections. Let's begin with our guests. And uh, Dr. Leonard Zewa, give us your impressions about the elections which have just been concluded, the general elections. Okay, thank you very much, Sewell. I think the election has been with uh, a mixed bag, bag of experiences. Uh, many of the voters across the country had some challenges voting. Um, some others also find it very, very smooth to vote. The international observers and other countries also have their own also, what they think about the election itself. Most of us who are also involved in the electoral process are also involved as a top stakeholder, also have our own impression of it. But generally, the 
the situation, the way it is now is that we seem not to have done or fared better from 2015. Generally, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, it's a function of so many things which we'll be talking about tonight. All right. Um, Professor Audugambu, let's hear your comments on the elections. Thank you very much, uh, Sir. Uh, the 2019 general elections uh, have come and gone. And um, many stakeholders have different, you know, uh, perspectives on the election. Uh, first and foremost, let me say with uh, all sense of responsibility that Nigerians were quite enthusiastic about choosing leaders that will lead them. And that could be seen in the first leg of the election that the presidential and national assembly, there was mass turnout of Nigerians to vote. And you could see the interest, you could see the enthusiasm about their determination to have leaders that will bring development, leaders that will meet their developmental aspirations. And uh, of course, the most critical national challenge Nigeria is facing today is the issue of security. Insecurity is so widespread across the length and breadth of Nigeria. And so you could see that expressed in the determination of Nigerians to get credible leaders that will really uh, 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 respond to the security uh, situation in the country generally. And so the first thing that I noticed with respect to the election was the postponement that came to many Nigerians, particularly myself. Actually, I had traveled a very long distance uh, just to cast my vote, but I was disappointed when I woke up you know, uh, the following day, that Saturday night, uh, uh, at least I, I, I got set for the election only to be told by a friend that they have postponed the election. And I, I felt terribly disappointed, actually, especially with INEC. We had that in 2015, but that of 20, at least there was sufficient time given for everyone to adjust his or her program. But this one, People have traveled, people have expended resources and all whatnot to go and exercise their civic right, only to be disappointed through the pronouncement of the postponement. That's okay. At least we have taken it in good faith. But, but did you eventually make the return journey? Well, I, I, I in fact, uh, through very, very stressful condition, actually. Okay. Because, right. and uh, when they eventually scheduled the election for February 23rd, of course, mobilizing resources to go back to the, my voting point was a problem. Uh, federal government said we are going to pay salaries, you know, uh, on 23rd or is it uh, earlier than that, 22nd or so, so that at least people can travel freely to go and vote. And we waited patiently. That didn't come. I had to, you know, uh, reach out to my uh, servants which, of course, was meant for a different purpose. But because of the interest I have in this election, I had to take something from it to enable me to go back to my voting point to vote. And so generally, like many have said, one interesting thing about this election, of course, is the fact that Nigerians are growing in terms of political consciousness. You can no longer take Nigerians for granted anymore. Uh, politicians have not learned anything. I, I, I can say this very boldly and with all certainty that politicians appear not to have learned anything. And you see, can see that expressed in their attitude. They still do or die. Politics is not about do or die. You don't push it to that extent. It's all about interest. And you know how to push your interest through. Uh, you mobilize, you know, the electorate, tell them what you think you can do for them, and let them decide whether what you think you can do for them is compatible with their own interests. And if it is, you don't have to use any kind of force. You don't have to use all kinds of illegitimate means in order to achieve legitimate goals uh, in an election 
of this nature. And so I'm happy that Nigerians are gradually growing in consciousness. Although there are very many out there, the illiterate, the poverty-stricken Nigerians who are still vulnerable to the manipulative tendencies of our politicians. You see vote buying everywhere. People were given as low as 100 naira, 500 naira to have their votes. And of course, given the level of poverty in this country, uh, it's very, very difficult for an average Nigerian to resist that kind of sinister influence through the use of material influences. And right. I think that uh, we are gradually, we are, we are maturing to some okay. extent. All right. We'll, yes. we'll return to some of those issues you raised. Exactly. But let me come to Rotimi Uyekomi. Well, this time, uh, the question will be a little bit different since um, I, <laughs> you uh, were part of the election management body. And so for you, would say, how challenging was the 2019 general elections? Thank you very much. Uh, first, I have a confession. Mm. Uh, I'm a journalist, mm. and a very proud one at that. Right. I spent some time with the newspaper house, and it was easy to write about government establishment from the outside. Right. But I've been with INEC now for three years, and I've seen how they do things. And I've come to appreciate the challenges they face, which I could never, ever have imagined from the outside. And so when I see narratives or reports uh, in, in newspapers, on radio, on TV, by my colleagues, I, I marvel. And then when I discuss with them, I always say, you have no idea what is going on. And I will readily recommend, honestly, to media organizations to allow their editors and journalists to spend some form of sabbatical with government institutions to understudy how they do things. I think, for me, the most difficult decision for the INEC chairman and the National Commissioner was that night when the election was postponed. It was a very difficult decision. I could see pain all over them because they knew what it meant. This was an election that was very meticulously planned for. I followed through the process, you know. We were coming from 2015 that was highly successful, and we were trying to build on the successes of 2015. But things have changed since then. Uh, people don't often appreciate what has changed between 2015 and now. First, at that time, we had less than 30 political parties. Now we have 91. At that time, we have over 69 million registered voters. Now we had 84 million, over 84 million registered voters. So that meant that the logistics would be different. We had to print more ballot papers, wider, with more columns. We had to bring in more logos. Uh, we had to make more preparations. And we had to deliver these materials to 119,973 polling units across the country. In a country where INEC does not own an aircraft, and has limited vehicles. To plan for this election, we had to sign memorandum of understanding with transport unions. We had to enlist the services of the Nigerian Air Force and other aviation companies. It was a huge, huge thing. And you think you have this plan, and then something happens on the day that movement was to take place, and then you have the transport union coming up with one excuse or the other. Maybe they turn sick, somebody that is supposed to move ballot papers, from Bauchi to, to just will not turn up, and then there is no replacement, and then time is wasted, and Nigerians don't understand that. They just want to open, they want to get to their polling units at 8 o'clock on election day, and they want to see all, all the officials. We had to take over a million ad hoc staff, including our beloved members of the National Youth Service Corps, uh, who, without whom, of course, we can't organize elections. Uh, we have learned a lot of lessons about preparations, about logistics, and about these shocks that could come up, you know, uh, unexpectedly. And I think going forward, uh, we are going to leverage on these experiences to make Nigerians enjoy the process of election 
in a better way. You think to a large extent, um, many Nigerians were a little bit unfair to the election management body in terms of um, the criticisms and the knocks um, that INEC received. Yes, I, I was like them in those days. Um, it was easy to criticize INEC, mm. but for the tremendous work that they do, honestly, not just at the leadership level, the total number of INEC staff is a little over 16,000 all over the country. People don't often imagine what it means to have 16,000 people manage election in a country like this. It's huge. You have many of them staying away from home for several weeks. Wives missing their husbands and children. In this election, for instance, they go days on end to deliver materials, to conduct trainings, to do all sorts of things. And because people don't know these challenges that they face, this work that they do, it's easy to criticize. And my, my hope is that somewhere along the line, as we move to the future, Nigerians will have, if they take more interest in INEC, because I always say it, INEC belongs to all of us. You know, it's not a case of we against them. I just want Nigerians to switch positions, to come to our side and we go to their side, and then they will appreciate the enormous challenges that the Commission faces in conducting elections. All right. We'll return to you. Thanks a lot. But uh, let's go over to our Kaduna Center, and uh, where we have uh, Yunus Ustaz Usman, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Let's just go straight to it and ask you your impressions of the just concluded elections. All right. I'm, uh, I'm, well, uh, I, I'm afraid we have uh, uh, some challenges with uh, getting the sound right from our Kaduna Center, where Yunus Ustaz Usman is. We'll we'll return we'll return to him in 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 in, in, in a minute. But let's let's see if we'll fare any better with our Maiduguru Center and uh, Center Kaka Malam Yali. If you can hear me, uh, give us your impressions of the elections. was okay because the election was conducted uh, orderly and it was peaceful and there was impressive uh, turnout due to a relative uh, peace in the state compared to 2015. Well, yes, but what, 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 what would you say? Was, when you, certainly you've observed the elections, particularly 2015. Coming from 2015, 2019, what impression did you get on a general scale? Uh, on the part of the INEC, uh, the logistical arrangement was good. Uh, everything went uh, okay. Uh, the staff arrived uh, on time, uh, the people turned out and uh, voted orderly and peacefully and there was no single uh, uh, violence or uh, acrimony or, 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 uh, on the part of the voters. Everything went on uh, well. All right, that's some, that's some <laughs> a good scorecard from uh, uh, Bornude. I'm sure Rotibi would have been pleased with those comments. <laughs> but anyway, back here, of course, um, one of the unfortunate issues that um, was played up during these elections was the question of violence. And this Nigeria has been grappling with over time, yes. how to take out the violence from the politics. And uh, it reared its head again this time around. Unfortunately, there were fatalities. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think uh, that, that has been um, 
a recurring uh, problem in this country, and that is because of uh, the high monetization of, of getting into political offices. Uh, the politicians see going into, into politics for the sake of making money, and uh, it's this same mindset that they also try to get across to their followers as well. So it's just about the money thing. And so one of the key solutions that we need to put in place is to find out how we can work towards demonetizing excessively getting into political offices in this country. If that is done, I tell you we'll be able to address this issue of violence and other things. Why do I say so? Um, if you look at the history and the experiments of advanced political, and political countries, you will observe that those who go to public office do not go there essentially because they want to get the financial component of it. But they go there because they want to serve the people. But what we experience here is that people who don't have any business going into politics for the purposes of serving the people find every means, whether they have the requisite background, experience or whatever, to get to the political office. Everybody will fight themselves to get into that political office because they see there's a new huru, that's where the money will come from. Mm -hmm. And so, and you have people who are following them, their supporters, seeing that look, at the end of the road, when our leader or the person who we are supporting gets to the political office, there's going to be benefit for us. Um, the talks will be paid, people who have worked for us will be paid, and other things. So I think the basic thing for us to do basically is how do we really address rewarding political office holders. Now, specifically on the violence side, we also look at the, the trust deficit as a result of the activities of talks, activities of the high militarization of the electoral process. We also look at the situation where people, supporters, are also fighting among themselves. Now, so if we look at the violence itself, we can understand there are certain states across the Federation where you have this recurring thing, phenomenon every time. Of course, you look at River State, for instance, we know that, we know that River State is a hotbed. Um, so when, we, when the umpire, ANEC, is planning for such a thing, in concert with other stakeholders, they would need to put more effort in trying to see how can we resolve the problem in places like River State, places like uh, Bayasa State, places like Aquaibom State, places like uh, Lagos State. Now, those areas, extra effort should be made to see how they can work around containing these excesses, this violence and all that. Not to say that there are pockets of violence across other places in, in this country, but specifically these areas, if they had done much more, it, will, it won't have gotten to this level. A situation where even one particular person die on account of election is a serious matter. And when it becomes a recurring phenomenon in a democratic country like Nigeria, it calls for great concern. And we should weep about it. The last report I read, we've had over close to 40 people that have died on this election through um, the presidential election and the National Assembly one, as well as the gubernatorial and the, and the state assembly. So to address, to address this violence, one of the key things we need to do is let us reassess how are we going to make sure we demonetize the office, political offices that politicians are holding. Once that is attacked and addressed, I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get some hold on why this violence is continuing regularly. Uh, Prof. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Uh, the issue of violence, unfortunately, has become part of our political culture. And I said unfortunate in the sense that uh, that is rooted in our perception of politics. Many look at politics as an immoral social activity, and yet, Politics essentially is a moral activity because it has to do with serving humanity. You are looking for a platform to render service to humanity. And uh, if we look at it from that perspective, it then means that it's not everybody that is fit you know, to do this. But because within the Nigerian context, and especially as it relates to electoral politics, what you find is that people who do not have what it takes to lead, people who cannot even lead their immediate family, you find them struggling
to occupy one political office or the other. Politics essentially is about contestation of ideas. How do we move the society forward? How do we tackle the issue of insecurity, for instance, the issue of uh, the economy, uh, the issue of corruption and all this? Unfortunately, our politicians are not only deficient in respect of this you know, generation ideas that will move the society forward, but they use violence to cover up. And that is why I said from the beginning that uh, our political environment is such that people do not appeal to the electorate on the basis of ideas. They don't. When they meet them, it's either they are distributing all these perishable things. You know, they become situational philanthropists, politicians. That's what they do, you know. At uh, every cycle, election cycle, you find them visiting people that have, they have not visited for quite some time, you know, to give them all these perishable things or to either buy their PVCs. You know, I look at that as very abnormal in a country's democratic, you know, uh, project. And like uh, my colleague here has said, truly speaking, I think the stakes in politics in this country are pretty high. And that is what is breeding this culture of violence. People see, in typical Machiavellian dictum, the ends justifies the means. And it flows from our perception of politics. It's an immoral activity. So whatever means you can use you know, to achieve the goal, it doesn't matter. That is exactly what, and nobody is being punished for perpetrating violence during elections because our institutions are weak. I expect that by now we should have this uh, electoral offenses commission. People have been agitating for that, we have been pushing. But one thing I've noticed with respect to the Nigerian system is that, yes, we have challenges this year, 2019, and I'm telling you, if if, if you watch out very carefully, 2023, this same challenge will still rear their ugly heads. These same challenges. Because we have this tendency of pushing issues aside, sweeping them under the carpet. And this, you don't need to wait until when it is uh, 2022. Then you begin to plan for 2023 elections. I think we need to do a lot more so that we can put things in proper perspective, things can be implemented smoothly when you have enough time to think through and to anticipate you know, challenges and how to respond to those challenges. So violence, if we must tackle violence within the Nigerian context, then it means we have to uh, reduce the incentives. We must reduce the incentives. Oh. Politics is seen as the quickest means of you know, becoming rich in this country. All right. Well, totally well, well, for you, wrote to me, there are some of these issues are beyond the commission, for instance. Um, uh, can, can, commission can't be held for what happens. The U.S. is basically to superintend um, uh, uh, the exercise. And INEC itself was a victim with um, INEC facilities, you know, vandalized, burned, even on the eve of the elections. And, but in terms of planning, all these factors are taken into consideration and then the collaboration with security agencies. But how robust was it this time around? Thank you very much. It was quite robust. Um, let me take you back a little bit. Between 2015 and now, we have conducted 195 different types of elections. And there was no single election we conducted without cooperation with the uh, security agencies because they have the responsibility of securing the environment. Uh, we enjoy that robustness and if you check all through the elections, I can't recall anyone that somebody was killed. Uh, we conducted, for instance, seven off-season governorship elections. I can't recall anyone where people were killed in the manner that they were killed in this particular one. And it's, it's, if there is one dream we have, we have at INEC is to wake up one day and find that we can conduct election without having any fear that somebody will come and disrupt 
the election, attack our staff, you know, break ballot boxes and set fire to our offices just because of one reason or the other. So that synergy is there. Um, we had several meetings with uh, uh, security. There is actually the interagency consultative committee on election security, which is very robust, it comprises uh, all the arms of the uh, security agencies. Uh, and of course, the police is uh, involved in all of that. Um, we had several meetings and they have that knowledge. Uh, they are experts in security and they know those areas across the country where there are, there are likely uh, violence that violence could, could occur. And they gave us all the dimensions and they assured us that uh, they were going to, to secure the environment. Uh, in that case, you know, our own is to conduct elections. Right. We depend on them to, to, to provide the you. security. But, but, but did you, as much as envisage that at this stage, uh, at this level of our development, uh, people would still go around and set INEC offices ablaze, set materials ablaze. Yes, yes, you've made provisions for redundancies. That's correct. These redundancies, the redundancies, were they, you know, were you thinking of uh, someone might commit arson, burn down INEC offices? Abso materials? Absolutely right. not. Absolutely right. not. Uh, they were, they were, we made provision for them just in case, for instance, on election day, we have some issues with a few of the smart card readers, for instance. We never emphasize that somebody will go and set fire to our office and burn over 4,000 uh, smart card readers. Uh, that, was in, that was in the plan. Mm. And it shocked us as much as, as, much as it shocked all well-meaning Nigerians. Okay. And I think that um, we need to have a conversation going forward on how to deal with this problem. We can't continue like that. All right. We have our very first caller on the program tonight, and uh, this is uh, from Burning Kebi. Mohammed calling in from Burning Kebi. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Our network has been commendable. Hmm. Hello? Yes, go right ahead. Go on. We can hear you. I, go on. Our network has been commendable. Okay. I want to suggest to the executive governor's election that they are seeing uh, a change in the uh, election. The disparity between the presidential and the gubernatorial and state election is, uh, is very far. And uh, this shows that uh, the masses or the electorate has no much confidence in the governor. So please, they should decide especially those that were re-elected. Okay. All right. Who wants to go for another uh, uh, official or political office? And okay. those that are new should know these challenges so that at least they will help in the democratic transformation. All right. Thank you very much. Well, let's, let's now try and return to our Kaduna Centre, hoping that uh, all your challenges have been taken care of. And, uh, Ustaz, if uh, you can hear us, um, we started off by asking your impressions of the just-concluded elections. And now, uh, you know, while you were at it, also, you know, comment on this recurring factor, which we also in the just-concluded elections, and that's uh, the issue of violence. You see, it is unfortunate that almost 59 years of our existence, our politicians have not learned at all, and it's most unfortunate. The spate of killings this year, I think, is almost uh, unquantifiable, and that is shameful. I think most of our politicians should be ashamed of themselves, even to call themselves Nigerians. I'm ashamed. They should be ashamed of themselves. That is not what we have bargained for. You see, um, the first uh, speaker did talk about the postponement by INEC. That may not be a blame on INEC. I think we should praise INEC for that. If INEC saw that, it would not be possible that, to hold that election. Instead of canceling it halfway, I think INEC was courageous enough to postpone it. 
There was a postponement in 2015, and which 2015 election I consider as the best so far in the history of this country. Um, we should not blame INEC for that. But then, I'm not happy about this issue of inconclusive election in some states, inconclusive this, this, that it, it is not fair. And the INEC chairman should know that his performance is gauged is by the performance of the former INEC chairman, Jega. If he doesn't perform to that extent, of course, he has failed. He should have that behind uh, his mind. But as regards the issue of violence, unless we do something about it, because nobody has really been punished for violence, and I'm sure that is why this is continuing. It is most, most unfortunate and is condemnable. Not only condemnable, but I think one of the ways of getting out of this thing quickly is to pass the Uwe's report on electoral reform. Buharis will do something about it immediately to send it back to the National Assembly, even as an executive bill. Because the punishments there are commensurate with what is happening today. But before then, may, may I commend the National Assembly and the President for having given INEC all the money it needed to start this thing with. And that shows that both the National Assembly and the President were anxious in ensuring that uh, we had a free and fair election. But unfortunately, the politicians disappointed us, particularly at the governorship and state houses of assembly elections. It is most unfortunate. I hope we will learn. But when? Uh, it is a very pitiable time that no, nobody can really guess. And that is unfortunate. OK, let, let, let's go over to uh, Maiduguri. Senator Kaka Malam Yali, if he's uh, still with us there in our Maiduguri Center. And uh, uh, the question for is, it, it, it's easy. Yes, well, before the elections, a number of Nigerians were on edge, given the security situation in the Northeast. But as it turns out, Bornu particularly, as it turned out, um, we didn't hear the kind of stories, we didn't get the kind of stories we got from places like Rivers, Benue, and uh, Lagos, surprisingly. What do you think was responsible for that, that where everyone thought would be, you know, a theater of war? It turned out that the elections were carried out and those uh, issues were almost non-existent. Up to this moment, I have not heard or seen a single incident of violence in any part of Borno State. In 2015, I voted in my Maiduguri, but this time I voted in Kanduga, my village. It was peaceful. There was no problem as far as the security situation was concerned. And uh, because of the restoration of uh, uh, normalcy. Uh, there was a great improvement on that. So uh, the, the, the armed forces, the government, and everybody uh, deserve commendation uh, for that. Do you feel when you got reports from other parts of the country about violence? What? <coughs> what? <coughs> Let me, let me repeat the question. What were, you, what were your feelings when you heard of violence in other parts of Nigeria? Sad and unfortunate that people still engage in violence for electing their leaders. That's very sad, very unfortunate. What does it say about the political culture? We improved. We have still a long way to go. Though there was massive turnout, there was interest, there was enthusiasm, yeah, we have still uh, uh, a lot to improve. Okay, we'll return to you in a moment. Um, uh, still a lot to improve in our process. But you started off, um, uh, Dr. Nzema, you started off by saying that uh, the political class um, is yet to imbibe um, certain lessons, yes, and uh, that's what has led to it. And you talked about demonetizing political office. 
Now that's a function for not, I mean, that's not a function for one uh, segment of society, but it's, uh, it cuts across. Um, perhaps you should ask, what is the recruitment process for leaders? Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, uh, Prof has also, you know, talked about it as well. One of the key things we need to learn about is basically how do we identify political leaders? You have business leaders. You have also political leaders. And you also have religious leaders. Um, what we have seen, what we've seen so far, is what we call the shepherd mentality. You have people who think. Um, because somebody has won election at a particular time, I also win election. You're not looking at the pedigree of the person. You're not looking at the background of the person. You're not looking at the experience of the person. And so what we need to do essentially is basically, how do we begin to think seriously about making institutional arrangements where we begin to develop and recruit young political or young politicians that we take over from this recycled or Methuselah driven politicians that we have in place. And that informed why we try to work around what we call the, third, or the, the, the credible third alternative, where you have a bunch of young, fresh politicians who decided to work together to see how they can come out and challenge the, you know, the old politicians. When I say old, I'm talking about the predominant party, the uh, PDP, uh, PDP and APC, and the flock of politicians are in that. So to address the way we can begin to work around recruiting good politicians is, one of the key things is, we look at student union leaders. That's one area we get them. If we have credible student union, and I remember as a NAS activist in the past, we had a crop of very dedicated people that have semi characteristics of leadership. That is one area you can begin to work around that. We can also find them even in the, the private sector. You have people that have established leadership qualities that if they are given opportunity in the larger light of the political sphere, they can also demonstrate this leadership. You can also even look at the churches as well. You have people who have clearly demonstrated, you, can, you have people who have clearly demonstrated they have leadership qualities. I'm not going to name churches here, even, um, the, even the Muslims as well. If you take, for example, there are millions, there, there are churches in this country that have millions of followers. And you find out that when they are having programs, crusades, you find millions of people coming to that particular event. Immediately after the event, if you see the cl clinical precision with which both the traffic, the auditorium, everything around within that environment is done, and the way the leadership is organized, you find that these people have some leadership qualities. Now, these are the areas we begin to look at. And not only that, you find that some of those who are working with uh, the, the, the members of the National Assembly at the national level, those as well as at uh, the state level, you have their personal assistants, you have other group of people that also have ways they can begin to learn from these sets of people. So what I'm saying in essence is we have corridors, we have means with which we can find out to begin to recruit political leaders okay. of the future. But the question is, would the Methuselah-like politicians that we have in place All right. allow this to happen? We, we'll return to that, but let's try and take in this call from Maiduguri. Kabiru, calling in from Maiduguri. Hello, Kabiru. Kabiru, are you still with us? OK, let's move on. Um, the recruitment process, Prof. Um, he's just talked about, um, you know, getting vibrant young people. Was that part of the attempt when we, this time around, had 91 political parties on the ballot and 73, you know, pushing to be president of Nigeria? <laughs> well, uh, I think I have a great concern about, honestly, the future of this country as it relates to leadership recruitment process. You have rightly made a very fundamental statement that, look, our leadership crisis today flows from the defective recruitment process. Yeah. And let me say this, uh, that if you look at, if you observe carefully the primaries of political parties before now, and that's why some of them are still in courts. 
because simple adherence to internal democratic processes of getting the people's choice to fly the party you know, flat, honestly speaking, is a serious problem. The role of Godfatherism is there. Uh, people would force themselves on others against all odds. And that is why when it comes to the secondary election, you see they are finding it difficult to market such people that are unpopular, but because of ABC factors, they emerge from such primaries. Some of them are so shameless as to use physical force. Yeah. They either disrupt the process or intimidate opponents. You know, opposition in politics is not the same thing as an enemy. I've always said this. To be an opponent is not the same thing. You are simply saying, look, I oppose your ideas, but that you cannot declare me an enemy because I am promoting a particular interest that is in conflict with yours. And that's why people look at politics as war without bloodshed. Imagine war being fought without bloodshed. But politics is war without bloodshed. It's contestation of ideas, like I've said earlier. You know, you propose this, somebody opposes it, and all this, all. Like, for instance, the way uh, things are done currently by the APC governing party. Of course, uh, the opposition parties can critically find fault with how things are not being done right. And therefore, you want to replace this government on the basis of what you have observed to have been done wrongly. Mm. And so when we look at leadership recruitment process in this country, they're not too young to run bill. Look at the contradiction. The same youth were the ones drumming support for the Metusela politicians. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> doctor, the and I think uh, I find that very uh, funny, actually. You said you want a law to give you legal backing to be able to aspire to any office. Yes. But the same people were drumming support for uh, people that, that, that have exactly. expert, let me say expert actually, politically. Because when the youth, the current set of youth, the current generation of youth, some of these people, in fact, uh, they can only read about them in history, you know, history books. <laughs> some of them uh, were at various levels, you know, uh, uh, were in leadership at various levels. And so, uh, when will it be right or will it be appropriate, timely for the youth to now take over this, the leadership of this country? And my guess is that you cannot have analog leaders in a digital age, truly speaking. Okay. They are extremely incompatible. All right, we'll ask you to pause a while. Let's see if we can uh, get this call from Abuja right here. Aminu, who's calling in from Abuja. Hello, Aminu. Yeah, listening. Right. Go right ahead. Yeah, good evening to the great mind in, uh, in the studio. Mm. I really appreciate their contribution. They're really making it uh, good, real good. Uh, I want to help uh, uh, Kakamala Yali from the other end. What happens in Medjugorje? I'm not from there, but actually from the reports we had from there, it's really fantastic. The, we must commend the, the Nigerian army and the police and the security agents. They did a great job there for them to have everybody in the same place for the elections. And uh, people were, you can see the enthusiasm in people coming out to vote because they feel protected, you know. So the fear of being, I mean, being attacked from the Boko Arams or the bad boys there, it's not there. And with the determination to vote, they were out there to vote, which uh, eventually turned out uh, a very good uh, success from that end. And uh, I want to go with the bills, uh, not too young to run. It's actually, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to call it there, because the arrangement there is not, it's not uh, so good for the matter to even get there. Because the process of the recruitment is defective, just like the way the professor is talking about. It's defective. And I don't want to use that word deception, because the masses are yes are out there. They want to. They are so determined to to to, to get there to contribute as well. They have. They have we have the resources, as in the mental resources to do so. 
but the the, the, the old the, the old politicians are there with big pockets. You know, they won't allow the masses to get there. Tell me, you are not selling phone at the age of uh, twenty-five thousand. I mean, twenty-five million naira. How do you expect me, who doesn't have two million in my bank account, to get there? Should I have to go to the bank and get a loan for that? What if I didn't make it up? How would I pay the twenty-five million naira? They really need to work on that. That is my take. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Aminu. But uh, you know, from arising from the issues that uh, uh, Professor Audu Gambo has. Uh, raise. Let's go to our Kaduna Center. And you know, sisters, let's put this to you. We talked about the recruitment process. Someone mentioned they're not too young to run, you know, law. And uh, another one mentioned the fact that uh, the young people who were supposed to take over from the aging generation, if they so say, uh, all right, um, were in their large numbers the supporters of the same aging uh, population. I mean, some would say, yes, you cannot jettison experience just for the sake of change. What are your thoughts on that? You see, to start with, I was thinking that the young ones will be able to take over successfully, but the way they are playing the whole thing now is that they will be worse off because they are the ones being used by the older politicians. But please, if you permit me, I'm interested in this recruitment, recruitment pr process. You know, the only way to go about it is this. Now, make public offices financially unattractive. First of all, it is only in underdeveloped countries that uh, membership of the legislative houses are full-time business. It is normally part-time, and you only get sitting allowances. If that is done, uh, this type of killing because you want to be there by all means may subside. Two, unless you allow for is it individual or private candidacy, if you say uh, you must be sponsored by a political party before, before you can come in, in fact, the money bags will continue to rule, even when they don't have that capable mental political barometer to rule, and that's what we are experiencing. Now, the next issue is this. Uh, somebody said we we'll go to churches and mosques to select people. No, it's very simple. The churches and mosques can teach. Yes. You say if you, the, the, the sins of being a leader, what you will reap, what your children will reap, I think our leaders have not uh, really appreciated what it takes to use fraudulent money to train their children. And let me tell you, in, uh, in, in the Bible, Numbers 14, verse 8, God says if you use fraudulent money, what we call haram, to train your children or even to do anything, that he will cause you to the fourth generation. I think our politicians don't even think about that at all. It's the same thing in the Quran, And nobody has really gone away with it. That is why we see with the greatest respect that you hardly see the children of some of our previous leaders who are anything. They are even ashamed of introducing their children to you. That is because they failed to realize that because they used this fraudulent money to train their children or even buy Kose or Akara for them, God has destroyed these children in their presence. Unless our leaders imbibe this, unless our leaders understand that they cannot go away with this, these things will continue to go wrong in this country. But I'm telling you, if, if you continue to cheat, you are not only cheating your children, you are cheating your fourth generation. Oh. You can't get away with it at all in life. That is not oh. possible. Oh. And un unless we learn that, even the young ones are not faring better. Something happened one day. There was a time I was saying, uh, maybe these young ones, I, I, I gave these Almagiri people some money. And the eldest one took the money and started running away. <laughs> Then I say, oh, where are we going in this country? So nobody has really learned the lesson, and it's most unfortunate. All right. Well, Rotimi, one of the biggest issues of uh, uh, the recently concluded elections was the sheer number of uh, contestants. And even starting with the parties, um, 91 registered political parties, and we understand that there are about 100 plus or so more who are still waiting on the wings to be registered. We had about 73 uh, presidential candidates and when it came to the issue of 
governors in some states we had as, as, as many as 70 people running <laughs> for the governorship now how do you manage an election with such numbers There's a lot of people talked about the sheer size of the ballot paper you needed to be trained how to even cast your ballot mm. and even put it in the box mm. that's correct for, for this election we had over 23,000 candidates for all uh, manner of election I mean uh, offices that they are contesting for and we held meetings with stakeholders especially political parties on the nature of the ballot paper the size and the design and you know that um, you cannot afford to miss out the logo of even one political party because that will create some problems and you will see the narratives in on social media about which finger you used to thumbprint mm -hmm. because of course now that you have more political parties the box where you're going to uh, fingerprint now instead of thumbprint because mm -hmm. we had to now come out to say that you can use any finger that you are comfortable with to to uh, you know put the ink there but you have to ensure that the ink does not slip into the box right. either on top of the, on top of where you are or or below it and I think that in terms of um, the political class, uh, we, our, 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 our greatest obstacle, our challenge, is adherence to the rules. Uh, politicians don't always adhere to the rules. And if they do that, uh, we are not going to have issues, we are not going to have problems. Uh, it is easy when uh, we, we have policies in place, we have the, we have the laws. Uh, for instance, we have laws about, against vote buying. We have laws against electoral violence. And there are penalties. And the politicians know that if they engage in these things, uh, it's going to, these are the consequences. But I think that uh, it will help the nation if they are prepared and they demonstrate uh, 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 in the willingness to obey these laws, because uh, any society without laws is, is doomed. That's our, that's our, and we always appeal to them, because if we train the voter, if we engage in voter education, but the political class don't seem to imbibe the culture of obeying uh, the regulations, then we're going to have serious challenges. All right. Uh, issues that will arise from the numbers, the, the numbers that you know participated in the elections, uh, particularly um, uh, the ballot paper, and people had to be trained on how to <laughs> fingerprint, mm. roll over, That's flattened. Right. You think that might have even led to some 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 ballots being voided because uh, some well, I, we saw people voting and. Uh, a number of people didn't know what to do with, you know, <laughs> the bulk of we, paper. We, we, we actually engage in um, voter education in that respect. Mm. But we can only do this much in right. a society like Nigeria. This country is vast. Okay. And I was joking with a colleague that even if INEC puts all of his budget, all of his money into advertising, it still, still wouldn't be enough all because right. of the nature of this country. Mm. Uh, at every polling unit, the presiding officer or other officials are supposed to demonstrate, especially to the non-literate uh, voter, Voters. how to, you know, cast your vote, you know, roll it up, roll. flat it, and drop it. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and that was done to a large extent. Okay. Um, we, we hope that uh, as we move ahead, people will understand more. We, we, are, we, are, we are willing because even we, we, we went to the extent of translating these things into local languages. Uh, in the East, we, we had the languages for the Southwest, for the North, so that when people, they can easily read how to, how to do these things. And we use the social media a lot. But of course, not all Nigerians are on social media. Yeah. On Twitter, for instance, we have over a million followers, but we have 84 million Nigerians on, on our register of voters. So mm. there's a huge gap. Okay. Well, at this point, we'll take a short break. We'll bring you some messages. There's more ahead, but uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Stay live, a network issue oriented innovation talk show. Thanks for staying with us. Many issues arising from the 2019 general elections. Let's get to see this report by Timothy Yusuf. 
the 2019 general elections took place on February 23 and March 9, 2019, respectively. Contrary to expectation, the general elections came up with surprises. Perhaps the most astonishing surprise was the defeat of the incumbent Senate President, Dr. Bukola Saraki. A cursory look at the voting pattern, especially for the presidential election, showed the dogged determination of the less privileged Nigerians to re-elect the man they consider as one who is most concerned about their welfare, President Muhammad Buhari. Prior to the election, we commend Mr. President for coming out to say Nigerians should go out there and elect people that will bring developmental programs and better their life rather than looking at him. Uh, we commend President for that. I just encourage everyone to give their support to the President so that the nation can move forward. And for the governorship and state houses of assembly elections, similar surprises were witnessed. But one major concern is the violence that led to the declaration of results from six states inconclusive, while that of River State was suspended. Uh, the commission decided to suspend all the processes in River State based on credible reports uh, from our field officers uh, to the effect that some of our um, field officers have been targeted for arrest, uh, some of them have been kidnapped. In spite of the few challenges, many observers described the election as largely credible. Performance and conduct of INEC officials. Observers reported adequate deployment and readiness of INEC officials who were organized and eagerly waited for voters to turn up for accreditation on, and voting. The, one, one of the positive things about this election is the, uh, is the reflection of some of the results. There was, however, some cause for a national discussion to reform the nation's electoral system for greater integrity and participation. The party need to call their support to be calm and to respect the process. It takes all of these different people to make a good election. To the executive branch of government, expedite the adoption of comprehensive electoral reforms. The presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, had already approached the court to challenge the outcome of the election even though political players and watchers described the 2019 general elections as an improvement over previous exercises. All right, that report by Timothy uh, Yusuf. But one of the issues, and I think uh, uh, the senior advocate, uh, uh, Yunus Ustaz Usman, raised it in his opening comments. So let me let's start with you. It's the number of uh, elections that were declared inconclusive. Uh, at some point in time, people would wait uh, to see the resident electoral commissioners. And this is before the uh, governorship uh, and the state house of assembly elections. And uh, inconclusive became uh, uh, something of a sing song. And what was the reason behind these? People have said high number of inconclusive elections. Thank you very much. Uh, it's quite unfortunate that we have some stakes about six of them and when we add rivers uh, we have seven that are yet to be declared um, the reason is that when there is external interference with our process it becomes very difficult to make a declaration um, I said earlier that we conducted about 195 different types of elections rerun elections by elections and end of tenure and in all of these elections, only about two of them had issues with the uh, tribunals. And the issue was not that go and conduct the elections again. The issue was that issue the certificate of return to another candidate other than the person that won. So when you don't interfere, when there is no violence, when you don't disrupt elections, it's very easy for us to make a declaration. And in, in the six states, that uh, we, did, we couldn't make a return. It, it was a combination of factors. Uh, one of them, of course, the first on the list is violence and disruption, like uh, all the discussions that I've identified here. Uh, ballot box snatching, abduction of our, of our officials, and, and you know, trying to disrupt the process. And there are, there, we, we, there are thresholds for declaring results, and if the process does not meet those standards, 
it would be impossible to, to uh, declare uh, uh, results. Now, in some instances, the, the, the election result, the, the, the race becomes very, very tight. Mm. Um, where you have, for instance, a constituency, um, I just want to make, you know, as an example, you have 50,000 uh, voters, and maybe the leading candidate scored about uh, 10,000 votes, and the um, second, the runner-up scores about uh, 8,000 votes, but you have over 30,000 votes cancelled because of violence or anything like that. So you can't make a declaration because the law says that those 30,000 votes are more than the margin of lead, which is just about 2,000. You have to mm. go back and do the election again. So those, of course, form part of the reasons why we are going back. But I think to a large extent, it is this violence that, uh, you know, this interference, abducting, in some instances, some of our registered electoral commissioners where, 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 you know, they had to run for their lives okay. in some of the states. Right. Mm. Let's get back to the phones now. We have calling in from Lagos, Bolaji. Hello, Bolaji. Yes, yes. Yes, I'm here. Right, go right ahead. You're on. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I quickly want to... Uh, I think I'm going to Yes, quickly, I just want to say that as far as I am concerned, none of these political parties uh, have political ideology. Uh -huh. uh, and to the INEC, uh, the INEC, uh, there's a more to be done on the part of the INEC. INEC will see this court virtually on daily basis of how their offices across Nigeria. Some of them have been attacked. And yet, I wonder what, you know, they do to give us security. Ordinarily, on the part of the Nigerian security, I expect more from the Nigerian security. Despite the, the money that was allocated, we had of billions of billions of naira, you know, that was allocated to the security. Personnel. But still, these issues of asking, burning, keep going on across Nigeria. Of, I mean, high-level offices across Nigeria. I think it's not bad. I thought I had a more patriotism on the part of our security agencies. You can report that one high-level office has been down. I mean, lots of demands that you should be for security all across. But, you know, two, three days later, we have another one, and it, it baffles me. And then, also again, concerning the station, you know, monetizing of political office order, where, where is the political we going to come from? Can we do that? Can we demonetize our political office, office orders with our, our policy without the legislature or the legislative arm of the government? Is it possible? You, you, you can we do that? So we don't want to legislate. We have the political will. We want to legislate against our own regeneration. So the Nigerians themselves rise up against this issue. We might not go anywhere. And, and uh, I, I, I want to commend the, the son from Sabrina. It is really easy to nail on the hill. And hey, it, 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 it is a prof in the studio. I, I'm enjoying their, their commentary. It, 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 they are just hitting the nail on the head. And that's how it should be. I think we now should be mobilized to rise up against this political class to ensure that this money that they are aiming is too because it's too long gone. They should pass it down. For crying for, for, out loud, they should pass it down. I mean, it's, it's outrageous. I, I, I rest my case at this All right. Thank you very much, Bolaji. Thanks for calling in. But let's still stay with the subject of um, uh, inconclusive elections. And, uh, well, uh, back to Akaduna Center, uh, 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 the senior advocate here. You, you started the issue of um, inconclusive elections. But 
give us an insight with what the electoral law says. Some people have asked for an amendment uh, because there are certain, you know, issues that they point to in that uh, electoral act regarding uh, inconclusive elections. And that aspect has to deal with where the number of registered voters is more, just like uh, Rotibi was saying. But some people are saying, if you talk about number of registered voters, you're not talking about the number of those who have collected their PVCs. Because INEC rule says, if you do not have a PVC, if you've not collected your PVC, you do not vote. So you may have, in a particular area, 1,000 voters, but only 300 would have collected their PVCs. But you, you, know, you declare results uh, inconclusive based on the number of voters and not those who actually have the PVCs. What do you have to say to that? No, you cannot declare results on, on the basis of, uh, of the registered voters. It is those who actually voted, and like you said, that is those who have their PVCs. If you don't have PVC, you cannot vote. Then, but what I'm saying as regards this inconclusiveness of, of election results, I want INEC to be uniform. If you say uh, the difference between this party A is three votes, you declare result, in another place is uh, one, and you say it's inconclusive. People will look down upon you, and people will always measure the performance of the present INEC with that of Jega in 2015. That is my question. And yet, you see, the Electoral Act needs serious amendments. But then the provisions of the Electoral Act, even the Constitutional, have taken care of these issues. One, there is this uh, amendment to Section 285 of the Constitution, which is now 285 subsection 13. It says where a person has not gone through all the electoral processes, uh, he, he can never be declared as a winner. Like, uh, I think we had one example in Katsina, whether somebody went halfway and said he's not doing it again or so. Uh, he's deceiving himself. And somebody else, like it happened in Kogi, can no longer uh, be tolerated on, under the present constitution. Uh, if that happens now, it means another election will have to be conducted. N nobody can ever ride on the gains of the person who, for one reason or, or, or so, even if it is death, you can't say you are now standing on the votes of the other person. It will have to be a fresh election. And, uh, and, and that is good. But my real worry, my real worry is this. Some of these people are, are, are doing this not from the bottom of their, of their heart, but perhaps in most cases, where they know their party is going to lose, or they are going to lose, they will think that well, if they say, I'm, I'm getting out, uh, maybe it will be given to my, to my runner-up or so. It is no longer so. And Section 35 of the Electoral Act now specifically says that even in the, if, if, you, if you now want, want to withdraw, you cannot withdraw unless you are giving this notice of withdrawal to your party at least 45 days before the date of the election. So the, the politicians can think that they can dribble us, but I don't think they can continue. Uh, we didn't have uh, reports of uh, inconclusive elections uh, from Maiduguri right and So um, uh, for uh, uh, Kakamala Miyali, you know, you had such reports from other parts of the country, but you didn't have any such reports from uh, uh, Bornu. But of course, you do have an opinion on these inconclusive elections. What, what are your views on, 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 on the inconclusive elections, and what would you recommend as a way out of them? You don't have it in Borno. You don't have and, uh, it in Borno. INEC should not be blamed for that because they are being guided by rules and regulations before they arrive at that decision. So they should comply with the law. So they should not be blamed. <laughs> Dr. Leonard Zewa, <laughs> let's hear from you. Inconclusive elections, six, six states, right? And then you had the suspension in rivers. I think the whole thing boils down to you know, what I call political arithmetics. Mm. Um, where numbers now are playing out and vis-a-vis uh, -vis 
and the rules and regulations put down by INEC is a tough call. Um, well, Rotimi has clearly said that it's not been a very easy job for them. But I, I think that uh, what may have informed why they took such decisions was to avoid a situation where they'll have crisis on their hands as one of the key reasons. What, what I would advise, what I would advise is in going forward in having these elections, subsequent elections, they need to make sure they are transparent. They need to make sure they put their legs on the ground. They need to make sure that everything is taken care of. And they need to make sure that decisive decisions are taken at, at the right time and when it's supposed to be taken. That's my advice to the electoral empire. Bro. Yes, I, I think uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really envy INEC because this issue of inconclusive election we is beginning to is, be, is, 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 is there in plateau? Yes. Right. It's beginning to affect you know, the public perception of INEC. Many people out there may not be as informed as uh, the explanation you have provided here. And coincidentally, some of these states are where opposition are about to win the election. And then they are declared inconclusive. And so people are left with the perception that, look, this thing is targeted at the opposition. You know, stopping opposition from you know, uh, winning you know, power at that level. And so unless you go on air to provide <laughs> adequate explanation to Nigeria, honestly, it's affecting the integrity of INEC. Many people out there think that uh, when you declare an election inconclusive, it is targeted at the opposition. Yeah. You know, and so if you look at the uh, Bauchi, Adama, Kano, uh, Kano uh, Plateau, uh, uh, is it Rivers, and all whatnot. So I think, to me, uh, there should be an amendment to that aspect of, of the electoral act. That is, I think it's, a, it's a principle of simple, you know, majority, majoritarian principle. And so once someone is about to be declared, you know, the winner of that election. All those technical, you know, concerns, I, think, I think should be set aside. Right. You need to, well, well, Rotary, you need to you, may, you may need to clarify further this issue, right. particularly with uh, the question of um, the number of registered voters. Mm -hmm. As you know, because this has been raised. A lot of you find these, you know, arguments in in the public space. Mm -hmm. That's correct. You know, uh, the the reasons for not declaring results are not the same for all the states. And first of all, um, it is not true that we are targeting a political party. Mm. You know, it may appear so, but it is not so. Remember, we have declared results in 22 states. And all these states were not won by one political party, right. you know. As, as the PDP won, so APC won some states. Those were the states that didn't have the problem that met the threshold for declaring results. And if you declare results when you are not supposed to, somebody will go to court and get the results nullified. I was saying something uh, earlier on that we conducted 195 different types of elections. Those, so many of them were court ordered arising from the 2015 general elections because somebody saw loophole in one or two areas and took advantage of it. And the tribunal said, go and conduct these elections. So we had to deal with all of that. Now, what guides INEC and may not be so clear to people is that, you know, if they, they are, apart from having the majority, there are other technical things that the constitution prescribed for you to be able to declare a winner. And um, if I go through all of that, we are going to spend some time. But I think that the simple way I can describe this is this. Now, if you have a constituency in some areas where, unfortunately, we had cancellations. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, cancellations when, for instance, in our guidelines, you must use the smart card reader. In some of the areas, there was deliberate non-compliance with the use, use of smart card reader. And when you do that, what our guidelines and rules say is that you call that place zero. You know, people, some people simply refuse to use the smart card reader. And the smart card reader is very important in authenticating, in identifying the permanent voters and authenticating you 
as the person that is actually on the register of voters. And where you have violence and the numbers are substantial and it affects a large number of, of voters and the margin of lead becomes very slim. I, I was trying to explain it in a simple way. For instance, if in a constituency um, the, the leading candidate scores about 30,000 votes mm -hmm. and the runner of the second person scores about 25,000 votes. Mm. And unfortunately, in that particular constituency, you were forced to cancel either through violence or some other things, 20,000 votes. The margin of lead is just like 5,000. The law says that you have to take cognizance of those cancelled votes for whatever reason and give them another opportunity to vote because the result will substantially affect the okay. overall result. Oh. So that's how the team plays that. But there are technicalities around that okay. that probably we need to communicate more. Now, what needs to be done if people want this to change is to go after that law and amend those Thank laws. Right. Okay, we have a caller from Ilori, Israel. Hello, Israel. Right, okay. Speaking about uh, Ilori and, uh, well, the dropped call we had there, let's come to the surprises that we saw in some of the elections. And, uh, yeah. well, let's begin with you, uh, Dr. Nzema. We saw certain surprises. Yes. Some parties going into uh, some areas considered the stronghold of another party and uh, winning, and uh, it got across. Yeah, I think even be, yeah, apart from the party's uh, dominance, there's a curious thing that did happen that kept me wondering. And that's also uh, is around the high expectation and the high, you know, the way we have taken politics in this country. In Plateau State, uh, precisely in a Pagana constituency, there is a, a candidate, Ezekiel Afeni. He won the election. And after winning the election, a few hours before after winning the election, the man died. He died. Uh, we describe such incident as giving up, giving up complex, where the expectation is so high on the part of the person that has won an election or has gotten victory, he could not manage such psychological excitement and he gives up. And that will also begin to, uh, begin to raise a lot of questions. These people have invested so much emotionally. They've invested so much psychologically. They have invested so much financially. At the point where they are to reap the reward of what they have gone into, they died. That is one lesson I've picked up. So um, it's an area we also have to look into. Wow. The other surprise I want to, before I get to the point, is that of Lagos. Now, the area I'm concerned in part of Lagos is um, the alleged threat, the alleged threat of voters not to vote a candidate based on some certain consideration and all that and the politicking that played around before they came around it well it still gets down to one particular thing this issue of state of origin and state of residence and all that i don't see a situation where somebody who may have lived in Kano or who was born in Kano, whether he's from the southern part of this country or any part of the country all his life is living in Kano and he says he wants to contest for election or he wants to vote for another individual and that particular person will be told not to vote wherever he wants to vote there is a problem so those are some of the lessons we need to write those are some of the lessons we need to know now regarding the pattern of voting itself regarding the pattern i see no significant difference no remarkable difference with what has played out in the 2015 and the trend and what we're experiencing now um, um, we had 15 million as against 11 million. That is, the APC won by 15 million against 11 million. So at the end of the day, we're having about 3.9 million over. If you, look at, if you look at the percentage difference, we just came down to the whole thing. And that's what I was trying to describe about the political arithmetics. It boils down one particular, the pattern and the trend significantly did not change. Those in the Northwest, those in the nor Northwest, where we have predominantly very large number of voters, you find out those states like uh, uh, Katina, uh, they all voted, they all voted APC. In the south, in the southeast, 
we also saw that they all voted uh, the PDP. PDP. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it, for the presidential. For the presidential. Yeah, but now let's look at the governorship election. Mm -hmm. The governorship election, the one that is truly really of concern is that, that what happened in River State. Right. And, okay. and I have tried to review the situation in River State. I cannot give a handle as to what is happening in that state. Um, Rotimi has clearly said that uh, they were to report back at, at, as it uh, 48 hours That's correct. for the commission to take a decision on what to do. That's but the level of violence in River States, the involvement of the armed forces, I would not say uh, the army, but I know it's a combination of the army, the air force, the navy and all. The whole thing that is playing out there is a confused situation. All right. Perhaps we'll await uh, that fact finding uh, the report from the fact-finding mission. But, uh, Prof, yes, looking uh, at um, certain uh, states which are lost out to, uh, uh, you know, exactly. certain I, political big wigs losing I think, out? I think uh, it's an interesting development <laughs> in uh, this 2019 election. Mm. Places that ordinarily you think that it's a no-go area, a, a no area for a particular political party, you mm. see that political party making inroad mm. into... Uh, who could have imagined that uh, PDP at the uh, gubernatorial election would make such an impressive outing in Kano? You know, uh, scoring over a million votes and about to defeat, you know, the incumbent. And suddenly, uh, Einek intervened to, to, to declare it <laughs> inconclusive, you know. <laughs> the same thing in, uh, you know, Oyo, Oyo State. Oyo, that one is a clean win, actually, because... Mm. The opposition at the presidential PDP won in that state. And at the governorship, PDP won with, I think, quite a number of uh, national and state House of Assembly you know, members coming from the opposition. Quara. So it tell, Quara, mm -hmm. Quara, exactly, Quara. So it okay. tells you much about the rising political consciousness of Nigerians. You no longer can take them for granted. a right or for granted. Because if you made electoral promises to them, and after three and a half years, no evidence or no promise that those promises would ever be fulfilled, of course they have the right to say, look, uh, on the basis of your account, uh, electoral accountability, we are sending you back, we are withdrawing our mandate and giving it to a new set of pe persons. And I think that's just what has played out. In Adama, for instance, of course, we can understand that uh, the um, state of the former vice president, the PDP presidential candidate in the 2019 election. So I, 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 I will not be surprised if at the end of the day, PDP will you know, capture right. power in and other states. Let, let's well. bring in uh, Yunus Ustaz Usman here uh, uh, from our Kaduna Center. Let's, let's bring in uh, uh, Ustaz Usman from our Kaduna Center. And mm. the surprises that people have talked about, where one party goes to another, otherwise the stronghold of an, uh, the opposition party and takes it up. We use Quara, for instance, as an example. And uh, the loss of certain big wigs, otherwise considered as uh, godfathers of um, certain areas. Yeah, 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 yes, I'm grateful. But, but before then, may I correct two uh, serious errors of law made by my, my, my friend from INEC and the other party. And uh, uh, please, because that is very important. He said, for example, where the, they canceled some results because uh, they did not vote properly or they didn't do it properly, uh, in such a case, there'll be need for a repeat. No, that is not the law. Except in cases of presidential election or gu gubernatorial, where they need to score one quarter of the votes for president in at least uh, two thirds of the states or the governor one quarter of the votes in two thirds of all the local governments for the legislative house it's just simple majority so if anybody has simple majority anywhere you declare him you won't say because some people voted wrongly then how are you sure that if you do it again they will not still vote wrongly i started this uh, election petition something since 1983 and the law has not changed that is the law up to now. Now, my brother, the, I've forgotten his name now, said he, he gave an example of where 
the election is concluded and the, and the person out of anxiety dies. Yes, that is, the, the law provides for it. Before the conclusion, like, like, like the case in Kogi, Audu, even if you were uh, the, the one who was likely to win and he dies, now the provision of the law now in section 285 subsection 13 of the amendment constitution, fourth alteration, is that the whole thing will have to be started afresh. But if he died after he had been declared, then in, in, in such a case, his running mate, if, it, yeah, if he's, a, he's a governor, his running mate automatically steps in. That is the position of the law, even as at today. Then, when the, coming to your question now, the issue of some parties surprising some parties. Uh, I've never been in politics. I don't like politics. Not, not the way we play it in this country and, uh, and, and anyway. But there is not be a surprise. I think it should be some, set of, some sort of credit to our electorate that we are no longer the fools that politicians thought Nigerians were. And that is why things are changing. And I think uh, it, it, it's a very appreciable thing. I, I hope it continues to, 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 to grow. But, but please, please warn the INEC chairman. Please, I don't like this idea of, you say there are two votes here, you de declare. You say there are four votes here, you say you are not declaring. No! It, 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 you see, let them not create problem for us. Please. Especially for the ordinary Nigerians. Because no, because his name is at stake. And people will measure his, his performance by Jega's performance. That is what, even if he's sleeping, that is what he should be dreaming about. All right, let's go to the phones now. Um, we have from Benin, Dixon calling in. Hello, Dixon. Hello. Hello, go right ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, you see what you people are discussing there about Nigeria election the gains and the elections. Don't think our politicians and our leaders are pushing us anything as to lead. Yes. Uh, what happened in this past general election is crystal clear that our leaders are not ready to learn to learn and they don't want Nigeria to go forward. You can see the voters are party in this second election. It was exactly as a result of what happened in that three January and February election that made so many people not to come out. And whatever the next man is saying to defend himself or his organization is not on the right track. Whenever election is conducted, I know nobody can see that election, but it's INEC. They have run that idea of staggering elections in order to favor one political party or the other. But when it goes to the other side, they will go ahead and declare the results. One or we do the election at Kogi. They are telling us about Madugri. All right. We have Boko Haram and every other is now being wrecking havoc and got here, got millions of these things. Please let tell Anek to go ahead and declare winners of this, uh, this thing, River State. Somebody did not have any candidate in election. And he goes up there to uh, wreck havoc. Is that not anti party activity? What is, uh, what is his party talking about it, talking about it? You don't have a candidate in election. You don't want people to have candidates in election to go ahead to to contest the election. So please, our people should look into the problems they are causing this country and stop it. We cannot be giant of Africa for nothing. We cannot be the most populous black nation in the world for nothing. Election all over the world is never to or die. The other man talking from Kaduna has said it all. There is nothing to write home about this correct time and his chairman. And a professor for that matter. All right. D Dixon, Dixon, if you can still hear me, Dixon, if you can still hear me, when you say that uh, you, you, you allege that INEC uh, has preferred, you know, that's the sum of what you were alluding to. Can I ask you, how do you explain it? Would it be that INEC has preferred candidates in all the parties and uh, 
Is that, so how does that play out when a party wins in an opposition enclave, cutting across you know, the two... Did you travel when the election was conducted in Ocho State last year? Did you travel, sir? All right. Anyway, we, we have our guests here. We'll, we'll ask them to respond to that. But le, le, let's try and get uh, the views of uh, Kakabala Viali in uh, Maiduguri. And uh, we're talking about, um, you know, the voting pattern, how some parties were able to make incursions into, you know, states that were considered the stronghold of other parties. What are your views on that? It, it was a positive development. Because some being political and uh, party leaders, they thought the party was their personal property or their personal estate. So because of greediness and irresponsibility, they lost their estates. It was a positive development for me. And this will serve as a deterrent or lesson for others who would behave in that way in future. All right. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nzema, let, let, let's look at it this way. Some people have said... We put INEC under scrutiny for just about everything. But the question is, is it INEC that organizes for ballot boxes to be snatched? Is it INEC that organizes for thugs to attack voters who have just come simply to queue? Why are we not interrogating what the political class are doing? Are those who provide the environment for such things to ha happen. Is it INEC that decides that uh, before we carry out elections, we have to put in so much money, we have to go through the painful process of shutting down the country, send election materials to the central bank, get all the parties to go there, pull out all the security agents and post them to election duties, is that is it INEC who does that? <laughs> um, I, I will not hold brief for INEC, but um, I, I do I do not also envy, envy that body. I don't envy them. You know, a lot of people have talked about decoupling INEC, maybe unbundling mm -hmm. INEC, and now begin to segment the functions around which they are doing now. But we should not forget that we are Nigerians. Even if INEC is unbundled, even if INEC is decoupled. Is this same Nigerians that will man different positions in these same institutions? So what I think it's so far, Jega had a sterling performance. Jega rules to the bar. Jega asserted himself as an umpire with incredible result. And so that's the benchmark with which we are now weighing, assessing the incumbent. Now, we are not going to blame my neck. Would, would that comparison be fair at this point in time? Yes, I think it's, it's comparable because if we wait between the period when INEC concluded the election, then during the Jagar period, and at the state it is now, you can see that we had less acrimony, we had less protestation, we had some level of comfort that period compared to what we're having, even as the process has not fully completed. So I can tell you that Nigerians have said unanimously that they look at Jagar's era as a golden period for Nigeria, for the INEC institution. Having said that, what I want to say is that we're not going to blame INEC for people who are snatching buses. We're not going to blame INEC for other things. But because we are stakeholders, you are a stakeholder in the whole process. The army is a stakeholder. The Navy is a stakeholder. The voters are all stakeholders. The international committee are all stakeholders. So what is given is that every particular stakeholder that's involved in this process has got to play his role. What I need to do, what I suggest I need to do is basically do more in terms of the communications they are doing out. Maybe they need to review and re-strategize on their communication strategy so that at the end of the day, they find a much more better way to reach across to different segments of these stakeholders. Now, on how to deal, on how to deal with this banner, uh, uh, those that snatches uh, ballot boxes, one of the suggestions I, I will give, in addition to what the Electoral Acts and the Constitution has provided, we have so much beautiful 
stipulations in our law books. But the thing is that the will to carry these things out is not there. It's not there. And that's why even when you catch these people red-handed when they're doing this, give and take the next one or two days they're out of that particular place. So what I would think is that every stakeholder at that level, whether it's a politician, for instance, let's say for instance, somebody is contesting an election, say in uh, Ushudi, for instance, and you have, the, you, have, you have the contenders, you have people who are contending there. I think for me, one of the suggestions I will raise now is this, and this will have massive followers. Mm. Every person, whether it is this candidate E, candidate e B, candidate C, candidate Z, anything that happens in that particular constituency, that particular politician should be held responsible. All right. Uh, at this point, let's bring in Rotimi, who has to respond to the issues you raised initially on uh, the performance of INEC. Let's Rotimi. Well, um, it, it, we are the weeping uh, boy in this whole thing, and people blame us. And I can understand Nigerians are very passionate and can be emotional about politics. And um, INEC does not plan for inconclusive elections. <laughs> we plan for elections, we want to conclude and get out of the way to declare the winners. Uh, like the INEC chairman will say, the happiest moment is when he's presenting the certificate of return to the genuine winner of an election after concluding the process and there is no interference. Uh, we, we hold it, you know, very dear to our heart if our processes are allowed to run the full course without interference. And that is what we pray for. And that is what we hope for. And our appeal is that if all the players play according to the rules of the game, election will be an enjoyable activity that it ought to be in this country. Uh, people should feel free to come out and cast their ballot without any fear or without any form of molestation. Uh, remember, we said that most of those engaged in conducting this uh, 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 election are our children. They are young boys and girls, men and women in the National Youth Service Corps. We lost an adult staff in Rivers, for instance, and it was very painful. I saw on the social media the picture of the husband in the mortuary looking at the dead body of his wife, who was our adult staff, and they had a child, and it was so painful. I still have the picture. It will stay with me. It didn't have to happen. So uh, people need to you know, pay attention to that, and we need help on how to make sure that such things don't happen again. All right, speaking about uh, the responsibilities um, that INEC has to carry out, let's go, let's go back to Kaduna and, and, you know, and get the, uh, the legal angle to this. Yes, people have said set up uh, uh, the Electoral Offences Commission or Tribunal, but at the moment, INEC is also expected to prosecute electoral offenders. Is that a fair deal for a body that should be organizing elections? I think, you see, it would be too much for INEC to say you conduct an election, you prosecute uh, uh, these people. Uh, uh, really, what the Electoral Act says is that when you get these people, they are normally prosecuted in the ordinary courts, or you set up tribunals. Now, we don't have tribunals specifically for the punishment, but then they can be punished in ordinary courts. And that is where, you, you see, um, if, if you look at it, when the president said, I think at, at the beginning, that, uh, <laughs> that anybody who snatched the ballot box will be dealt with in, in a special way, people were crying. But, but, but it shows that, that he himself wanted a free and fair election. And he didn't want all these, uh, all, all these ballot box snatching and the rest of them. He, he didn't want any election that would be tainted with fraud and all these things. That, that, that is the atmosphere under which he made that statement. And we should give him credit for that. But then, why this, one, this thing is continuing is because nobody has really, really been prosecuted. And unless we do that, these two will continue to uh, linger on. And then, again, to stop this, please, the security agencies must must never come near our electoral processes. Even if they are not armed, their presence alone scares the ordinary people. It is not done anywhere. 
And, and the moment it is done, the, the, the ordinary man will think that it is the government that has, has brought them there for a purpose. Hmm. Use them. All right, well, at this pressure. Well, at this point, we have to say uh, thank you very much to Yunus Ustaz Usman, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, who joined us from uh, Kaduna Center. We'd like to thank you very much for being part of this program. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you, you once again. Much. Thank you very much. All very right. Much. And also, let's uh, uh, say thank you to uh, Kakamale Miali, who's Chairman National Teachers Institute, also Chairman Bornu State Civil Service Commission, who joined us from uh, Maiduguri Network Center. Thank you very much. Uh, your last word as we say goodbye to you. Goodbye to you. Thank you. Goodbye to you. Thank you. Goodbye to you. So, uh, political communication and human development management expert, public affairs commentator. We thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, uh, we hope we'll, we'll, we'll have you again to discuss some of these other issues. Thank you. All right. Uh, Professor you. Audu Gambo of the University of Just, Professor of Political Science, we well, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us here. Uh, but you, you did get to vote, didn't you? Even though they all postponed it. <laughs> I, I voted eventually. Right. Even yeah. though the smart carrier declined to recognize <laughs> my... <laughs> but I, I was given the incident for the field. All right. So, so I so voted. You, so you, 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 you did vote. I so did vote, actually. Okay, because yes. the smart card reader. <laughs> uh, thank you, man. <laughs> one, one very quick right. last word. Yes, uh, the did. senior advocate made an uh, allusion that um, nobody has been prosecuted. Right. Uh, I want to say that in Minjibri, in Kanu, there was uh, a case of over 40 thugs mm. that were arrested and they were successfully prosecuted. Right. Although, of course, it would have been better if those who sponsored them were also exactly. taken. But, but we had that case point. and yes, so that's a good example and we hope to have more of that. All right. So we'd like to thank you for being part of this uh, uh, program. Well, there are so many other things. Uh, well, uh, of course, we, we've looked at it. We know that uh, uh, certificates of return will be uh, given out to um, uh, elected members of yes, the National Assembly on Thursday. Uh, uh, on Thursday. But we also see that even that has a development where INEX says only those who appear on the website. And we do know that there are some people who were That's reported correct. to have been elected whose yeah. names are not given. So such correct. people will not be given certificates they will of not return. Be given. We will not reward bad behavior. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. I like that. We, we, we like to thank you for being part of this. Thank program. you for having thank me. You. Right. Okay. And uh, to you too for being part of this program. I'd like to thank you. And uh, we say to you next week, we'll be back with NTA Tuesday Live. Join us then. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now.